from around the world. This is the Mutual Audio Network. The following audio drama is rated PG-13, suggesting that all children under the age of 13 should listen accompanied with an adult. You're listening to Audio Theater in a Darker Shade. This is DarkerProject.com. And now our feature presentation. The following audio is explicit in nature and may contain adult themes, light sexual situations, violent content, or strong language. time when the end of the world was just the beginning of a nightmare. When the worst of us set the world to burn while the best of us cower in terror. Tonight's presentation, Madness, written by Andrew T. J. Rowe. It's been a week since everything fell apart. Seven days since I've slept through the night, since people were normal. Nothing makes sense now. Everything's gone to hell, and those of us that aren't them, maniacs, monsters, demons, well, we're just lost souls now, wandering aimlessly through the ruins of a world that the worst of us set to burn, while the best of us cowered in terror. No one knows how good their life really was then, before the screaming, before the running, before the... blood. Oh God, so much blood. Everything made sense then. We were all sane, and normal, and safe. What I wouldn't give to feel safe again. What I wouldn't do to be so secure in my own ignorance that I could sleep out, unprotected, under the stars. Looking forward to three days with no diapers and no cartoons? No diapers, no (laughs) cartoons, no toilets, (laughs) no sex. Stop, you're going to make me wake Ellie. Sorry. (laughs) No, I'm serious. The four of you against the wilderness. It sounds fun. Wilderness? You mean the lake that's ten miles from town? The one with a gas station and boat rentals within walking distance? Oh, come on. You know you love playing tough survival guy with your friends, right? (laughs) It's a nice tradition anyway. What is this, the fourth annual Kavi hangout? Yeah. I don't know. We've all just, you know, grown apart since it started. Uh, But that's what makes it so important. You know, nothing's gonna ever replace your high school friends, Jared. I know... But with you going back to work next week and Ellie being so little... Ellie is almost six months old. (laughs) I think I can handle a long weekend. You know the cell reception out there is crap. What if something happens while you're home alone? Ugh! Oh my god! You're just pretending to be worried so you can keep those four cases of nasty-ass cheap beer to yourself, (laughs) aren't you? I mean, that it, that's bonus, sure. Uh, I knew it! You are such an asshole. Are you sure you're okay with this? Yeah, we'll be fine. 
Mom's coming over tomorrow. She's taking a shop in for baby clothes. Again? Didn't we just do that last month? Yeah, babies grow fast. <laughs> of course, sir. Uh, and if you want to come with us to the mall tomorrow, you know... Camping sounds like fun. I'm sure Mom wouldn't mind you tagging along. Okay, all right, okay, I'm going. <laughs> Shh, the baby! That Melissa? She doesn't look, uh, you know, pregnant anymore. Yeah, that happens sometimes when a woman gives birth. I mean, she looks hot. I mean, like like high school hot. <laughs> Come on, Stephen, that's your friend's wife. Jeez. You better have beer, Carvey. If you want it, you're carrying it, Larson. Aw, <laughs> look how cute they are together. And you thought there'd be no sex. Ugh, cringe. Here they come. Will you pop the trunk, babe? <laughs> and there we were, all together. No walls, no guns, no fear. Just friends. Happy. Safe. And Melissa. Christ, how could I have let you drive away? Where are you? Where's Ellie? What have they done to you? What have you done? Oh God, what have I done? Hey, Jared, you got your tent up? Just about, what's up? Steve got the fire going and Kevin's lighting the grill. I thought I'd take my truck up to the station and get some ice for the beers. You want to come with? Sure, just let me get this last steak in. There we go. Oh yeah, fit for a king. Hey, I wanted to say that I was sorry for not going down to Texas with you when your dad passed away. I wanted to, but... Hey, forget about it, man. You had a new baby. I get that. Still... I wish I could have been there for you. Nah, nothing to feel bad about. Just bad timing. Come on. Let's get going so we get back before the burgers are done. All right. I'll grab the cooler. Can I help you? Uh, give me two bags of ice. Hey, hey, look at the TV. I I think that's Sofer Airfield. Can you turn that up? I don't have a remote. Total is 427. Why don't you give your wife a call and see if she knows anything about it? I'll get the ice. Yeah, okay. Hey, no, I saw the airfield on the news at the gas station. Do you know what's going on? Yeah. Uh, I called Gary when I saw to see if they needed me to drop Ellie off at Mom's and come in. I guess some private plane had to make an emergency landing. One of the passengers freaked out. She stabbed a guy with a fork. Gary had to call the cops out. You aren't going up there, are you? Nah. Gary said it all happened really fast. The cops are already gone, and they stowed the plane in one of the old hangars. He thinks it'll all blow over by Monday before I go back to work. To be honest, I'm kind of freaked out about you going back to work now. Aw, oh, come on. This was one in a million, babe. The most dangerous thing I've ever seen at the airfield is a flock of birds on the runway. Still, air traffic control is stressful. And the last thing we need is more stress. Stop 
difference isn't exactly lax. At most, I have to juggle two planes and a high-flying kite. Stop worrying. Enjoy your weekend, would you? All right. Just promise you'll call me if you need anything. I will. I love you. I love you too. You really have to keep the ice locked up? I don't know, man. It's just some stupid rule. Whatever. Are you going to offer to help me out at least? It's okay. I got it. Unbelievable. You know, if you worked for me, I'd fire you on the spot, kid. Have a good day. You believe that little shit? Give him a break. He probably gets minimum wage for this job. My employees get minimum wage too. I wouldn't stand for them treating customers like that. You talk to Melissa? Yeah, crazy stuff, man. Kevin, man, I've been wondering how you keep that dive you own running, but I have to admit, those are some damn good burgers. Oh, hell, I, I didn't make the patties. Those were all Shannon's recipe. <laughs> I stand corrected. You'll be bankrupt by the end of the year. <laughs> <laughs> how is business at the restaurant? It's getting better. The economy's finally turning around, and I think we'll be out of the red in a couple of months. You should have gone into the liquor store with me. Times get tough, and people just started buying more cheap whiskey and vodka. Does someone want to remind me why I brought the beer when Chris literally owns a liquor store? Uh, because you're a sucker? <laughs> 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 oh, what about you, Steve? How's the bachelor life treating you? I wouldn't know. All these new accounts the boss keeps piling on me? Hell, I haven't even had a date in six months. Ooh, dry spell for Casanova. Maybe that's a good thing. I sometimes wish I would have focused more on my career before Melissa and I settled down. Yeah, whatever, dude. No, I'm serious. Between the house and the new baby, I'm looking at debt for the next 30 years. A family is expensive. It's good that you're getting ahead in your job before you start one. You mean if he starts one? Yeah, well, I guess luck's in the eye of the beholder. Also, fuck you, Chris. I mean, you aren't exactly drowning in family life yourself. I'll drink to that, Kevin. Toss me another beer. Seriously, Jared? You're a lucky man. Don't ever take that for granted. Thanks. What about you, Kevin? Any progress on the baby front? Nah. Shannon had to stop the treatments when the business started falling off last year. That hormone shit's expensive. Oh, sorry to hear that, man. Yeah, that's probably a good thing. I don't know what we would have done if we'd had a baby when the bills started piling up. <sighs> but we're thinking about starting over with the clinics next fall, if the restaurant does well over the summer. You guys have a liquor license, right? Yeah. I got this new micro brew in last week. Uh, local stuff. It's really good. When the college kids come home for the summer, I guarantee they'll go nuts for it. I'll set you up with the brewery, call in some favors. I bet I can get you a nice discount on the supply. Thanks, Chris. That's a great idea. Just don't let your place become one of those hipster kombucha shitholes, or I'll burn it down myself. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, I'm going to bed. Dude, it's like only 10 o'clock. Six months of 3 a.m. feedings train you to turn in early. Yeah, I had a 6 o'clock meeting this morning. I'm exhausted. Aw, oh, come on. Kevin? Do you want me to help you put out the fire? God damn it. Fine. But you guys are making up for this tomorrow night with ghost stories and marshmallows. I woke up in a cold sweat, like I'd had a nightmare that I couldn't remember. Something was wrong. Something was so wrong that I could feel the hair on the back of my neck standing on end. Looming terror threatened to crush me under an immense, undefinable weight. I had to call Melissa. I had to know that she, that Ellie, were okay. That they hadn't... something. I didn't even know yet. I fished my phone out of my backpack, my hands shaking with fear, and I felt an immense relief when the light from the screen washed over me. But that relief crumpled when I saw the no-service icon flashing in the upper right corner of the home screen. I tried anyway, desperately scrolling through my contact list until I found home, and I pushed hard enough that the screen distorted for a moment. 
I pressed the phone to my ear in time to hear the last numbers dial automatically. Then nothing but silence as the phone waited for a signal to latch onto. With the screen against the side of my head, I could see the bare glow of embers from the fire pit outside. Maybe it hadn't been put out well enough, or maybe it had been restarted and had since died down. <laughs> then I heard it, a barely suppressed laugh followed by Kevin's voice. Oh man, <laughs> they're gonna totally freak. His voice was wrong. Everything was wrong. I pulled it away from my ear and looked at it. Under my phone, the number flashed the words, waiting for signal, and I reluctantly hit the end call button and slid the phone into the pocket of my jeans. I didn't want to go outside. I didn't want to know what Kevin was laughing about or about what he was so sure I'd freak, but I had to. I couldn't just stay in the tent. I had to get out, get to the gas station and call home. Melissa, Ellie, God, where are you guys? I unzipped the flap of the tent, cringing at the buzz of the zipper that might as well have been an open invitation for the monsters in the night to come for me. Slowly, I crept out of the tent, crawling, then standing upright before I dared to look at the campfire. <laughs> Kevin and Steve were sitting beside the scant light of the smoldering fire. Steve had his back to me, and Kevin was watching him with a gleeful expression of disbelief shaking his head and whispering with childlike excitement. Next to Steve sat his old fishing tackle box. I couldn't be sure with the shadowy candlelight of the campfire, but as he reached into the box to pull out a large fish hook, I could have sworn I saw blood staining his hand. Kevin shook his head and laughed again as Steve brought the hook up to his face. Kevin? Kevin froze and looked at me as if I'd wandered prematurely into my own surprise party. A mad grin slowly widened on his face as he turned his attention back to Steve. Steve, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> oh, you're gonna love this. Steve slowly stood up, <laughs> the hand with the fish hook still in front of his face. When he turned toward me, I saw them, a dozen fish hooks piercing his bloody face. Four at least bound his lips together. The others had been haphazardly looped through his nose and eyebrows and the flesh of his cheeks and forehead. He was just feeding the last through his pupil, and I watched it pierce through the side of his right eye as he turned. I swear I could hear a sickening pop as it came through. What the fuck? Steve's face was contorted with rage as he fixed his eyes on me, a primal, guttural growl rumbling from his chest. As his mouth opened in an angry roar, the fish hooks binding his lips tore through in a torrent of fresh blood, leaving ragged tatters of flesh quivering over his bared teeth. Then, in an instant, he sprinted at me and tackled me into the tent. <laughs> Fuck. What the fuck? What the fuck? Oh god. Damn. You all right, Jared? You Oh shit. You, you shot him. Yeah. Fuck. I kind of had to. He was trying to choke you out, man. Did you I mean, is he dead? Yeah, he looks pretty dead. Fuck. What the hell is going on? <laughs> you should have seen your face, Jared. That was like the best reaction. <laughs> Go grab the towel out of my bag and clean that blood off yourself. I'm going to go check on Laughing Boy over there. I looked at Steve, or at whatever he had become. Chris had shot him right through the temple with a 45 caliber pistol I didn't even know he had. I hadn't even thought about us needing a weapon. Shit, I was so stupid. But even not knowing what Steve would become, not knowing anything that would happen afterward, I should have thought about bringing a gun to the lake. Hell, I, I didn't even own a gun. Not that Sofer, Kansas was a particularly dangerous place. Not then, at least, but shit, I'm rambling. Kevin was still laughing. He didn't just think that the horrors he just witnessed were funny. 
he thought it was hilarious. Like he was a kid again, cracking up over some juvenile prank. He was, well, he was acting crazy. Not violent like Steve, but crazy just the same. I'm really glad that you're enjoying yourself. But what the hell is going on? Did Steve say anything before Jared came out? No, man. Not a thing. This whole thing was just... <laughs> it was just totally off the wall. <laughs> Classic Steve, right? <laughs> Look, you need to chill out. What the hell was he doing with the fish hooks? Oh, that was the best part. <laughs> I just got up to take a piss. And he was sitting there... <laughs> Sticking them in. <laughs> I don't know if he was planning it or what, but that totally made the whole joke. <laughs> when Jerry came out, you should have seen his face. <laughs> it was just a joke to him. Kevin had sat there watching Steve mutilate himself like he was putting on monster makeup for a scare prank. And now Steve was dead and Kevin was just cutting up about it. Steve was dead. Chris killed him. No hesitation, no remorse, just shot him in the head. It was all so casual for him, like he'd shot a coyote that had wandered too close to the camp. That's when it hit me. Steve, Kevin, Chris, they'd all gone crazy in different ways at the same time. And somehow, I'd known it. I woke up terrified. For Melissa, for Ellie, for myself, without knowing why. But I had known. Somehow, I had known that I was in danger, that everyone was in danger. I wondered if they'd caught something or maybe they'd all been exposed to something, but that didn't make sense. I'd been with them all day and I was fine, shitting myself scared, but not crazy. I had to get back to Sofa. I had to find Melissa and Ellie, but somehow I knew that it wasn't just Steve and Kevin and Chris. No, I knew that the whole world had suddenly gone mad. You've been listening to Darker Project's production of Madness, written by Andrew T. J. Rowe. Featured in this episode were Persephone Rose as Jared Carvey, Tanya Milovich as Melissa Carvey, Shane Harris as Chris Larson, Dave Morgan as Kevin Folson, Edward Herman as Stephen Croft, Russell Gold as the cashier, and yours truly as the announcer. Madness is written and created by Andrew T. J. Rowe and was produced by M.J. Cogburn. The executive producer for Darker Projects is M.J. Cogburn. The musical score was performed by Celestial Aeon Project. This has been a Darker Projects production. Visit us on the web at www.darkerprojects.com. This is Mark Brzee. Thanks for listening. The bridge between men and machine. What kind of change? One that changes everything. The organic and the digital. His head, it's metal. Your friend Alvin the Chipmunk is a non-stop recording hard drive. The ability to record every human sense. Sight, sound, even thought. Everything anyone could ever see or hear gets recorded. Any human being could be a spy. This chip will allow us to know everything, as will the people we sell it to. They'll see all the data. Don't you get it? There is no one that can stop us. Hey, Rockstar. The Rapscallion Agency, a new audio drama from the creators of the Leviathan Chronicles, follows two of its youngest characters, Lizette and Chloracan, who moved to Paris. So, Clerken is in Paris. Welcome to Paris. Mm -hmm.
and find themselves entangled in a sinister plot to control the world's most sensitive information. I can take them out. I said there were three of them. Now there's two. We've got to get out of here. No one is going anywhere. Leviathan Audio presents The Rapscallion Agency, available November 1st. Subscribe now on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts.